So we're welcoming uh, Daniel Mitchen, uh, who is going to present the computational possibility of Jupyter Notebooks for biomedical publication, which is, a, I think, a, a huge public service you're doing. <laughs> and so thanks, uh, Daniel. Uh, please. Uh. Okay, are we going to close this Yes, door? I'm going so to. All tapings. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, welcome to this talk. I also brought you a... Uh -huh. I also brought you a graphical summary. Uh, anyone here who can kind of render the graphical summary in words? Short version is we have some computa uh, computation. We ca encapsulate them in Jupyter Notebooks. And the question is, if we rerun this, do we get what, ha what we had before? Um, and yeah, there's some. here's the structure of the talk. Uh, by the way, the slides are up on Zenodo. You can just follow that DUI, which is on every slide. So you, uh, you can browse it at your own speed. And there's some background to this. So I gave a very similar talk um, at the first uh, JupyterCon conference, um, where uh, I reported on the results of a doiton slash hackathon that we had, where we basically uh, worked on the same idea. Let's go to uh, a big repository of biomedical publications, PubMed Central. Let's search for those uh, journals that uh, journal articles that mention Jupyter uh, in some way, which at the time was 107 articles. And I did a similar search uh, yesterday, which was 5,500, and this morning was 5,508. So it's still growing. Um, and um, then um, back at that do-a-thon, we had trouble actually replicating these things. My motivation, initial motivation for going into this was I wanted to use Jupyter Notebooks as references on Wikipedia. So for instance, we had seen just this talk in this session here the, that glaciers uh, move at glacial speed, and Wikipedia has entries about all these glaciers, and so we could use those notebooks to illustrate those Wikipedia articles about the glaciers, for instance. And, uh, but only if those notebooks work reliably, right? And uh, for the notebooks that I've tried, I had trouble uh, rep rep replicating the things that they apparently did at some point under certain circumstances. And so there are... Um, and there was this 2017 JupyterCon talk. Then I gave uh, uh, another JupyterCon talk on the Wikimedia aspects of Jupyter. And uh, at the same JupyterCon, uh, my now colleague, uh, uh, Shiba Samuel, gave a talk that basically presented an automated solution to the problem that we had. So she built a tool, Reproduce Me Git, that you can feed a notebook in, and it, it will then visualize certain aspects of reproducibility. And then, so basically, the nucleus are, are that, uh, of our co collaboration is that we would plug her tool into our uh, pipeline and then basically loop over every article that we find in PubMed Central, and then over every repo that's mentioned there, and then every notebook in those repos, right? Um, I would also like to mention the, the last two uh, bullet points here. One is, uh, the, or the penultimate bullet point, is um, a pipeline that was used to analyze a million notebooks on GitHub. So no particular relation to uh, research, but still important. They share their code. We're building on their code. And then another one, the last one here, is a general recommendations on how to uh, use um, Jupyter Notebooks for, uh, in research contexts. Uh, the problem with those general recommendations is they don't actually feed into the workflows. They're just high level floating around. Um, now our study designs, we search at the database. Uh, we get back a bunch of XML. Uh, we parse the XML to uh, pull out first metadata that we can then use to, uh, for statistical purposes, uh, but also we are parsing the, uh, the XML for mentions of Jupyter and GitHub and NB Viewer and similar things. Then we normalize those URLs such that we uh, will be able to go to GitHub to find the repo that contains those notebooks. We then crawl GitHub. Uh, we clone the repo, we uh, look for the requirements.txt and similar declarations of dependencies. We install all the dependencies in uh, Conda environments, uh, then uh, and using the appropriate uh, version of, uh, of um, Python, for instance, if it's a Python notebook and so on. We run all the notebooks, we log the errors and the outputs, and then we compare the outputs to what was originally in the notebooks, and then we analyze. Uh, we have a preprint out there, we, uh, our data that uh, goes with the preprint and the code with the preprint is all public, and we invite you to play with this. L a note of caution, we're, you're playing on the scale of weeks here if you want to replicate that. Uh, here is a more detailed um, outline. I don't have the time to go into it, but I will show you another version of this thing later on. I, I'm showing it here because the reviewers actually requested it. We have like 50 page manuscript and they said, well, it's, there's not, it's not enough detail. And so uh, we had to provide more detail, and it's actually useful already. 
Um, but yeah, it, this requires more than the half an hour that I have here. Um, implementation, tech stack. So we had to run this in a cloud because at the scale that we're operating here, it's about a terabyte of uh, data. Um, and it takes weeks to compute. Uh, that's not a laptop kind of thing. Uh, so we are operating on shared resources, um, but thankfully donated to us by a university cluster. Um, and uh, we were using basically Python scripts on the Conda environments. And then uh, we were also, yeah, yeah, so the paper is still under review in a, in, uh, with a journal, and the reviewers also requested us to clarify our assumptions. And so I'm trying this here and then see how you react, and then we'll see how we can feed this back to the journal. So, for instance, we assume that uh, articles using Jupyter will mention Jupyter in some way. Uh, as Jupyter, IPython, or IPynB, uh, or and also GitHub, because we also only focus on those things that we could clone from GitHub. This way, we will ignore things that are not on GitHub, maybe on GitLab or Codeberg or somewhere in Bitbucket, something like this. And also, uh, the way we do this, we will find repos that are actually by someone else, not the original authors of that particular paper. So they might have mentioned in their paper someone else's GitHub repo, and that would be then part of our pipeline associated with, with one paper, even though it originated from some, somewhere else. We are completely ignoring a citation graph, and the justification for that is, well, we think notebooks should actually be cited, and we um, very much welcome that, but we didn't find any initially that were actually formally cited, and so for the purpose of this uh, run, we ignored that. Um, and then we also assume that mentions of GitHub can be normalized, so whether it's on uh, mentioned just by the repo or uh, by the URL of a particular notebook, or by an NB viewer URL or so, we can normalize that. And also, within a GitHub repo, the default branch to mine, because you might have many branches, is, is, is a good one to mine. <laughs> That's our assumption. And then also, Python is representative to do this analysis. OK. Um, here, now we have essentially the same graph. The main difference is now you have numbers here. So the um, numbers here that we start with, we have 1,400 articles. That, this is for the preprint, and so that reflects a run that we did in February 21. Um, and that, so those 1,400 articles came from 300 journals. They gave us 45,000 Git, GitHub links. And then the important thing is here, uh, 2,000 GitHub repositories. So we could condense these 45,000 links into 2,000 actual repositories. Um, and then those uh, repositories had 10,000, where is it? Somewhere here, 10,000 notebooks. And of those notebooks, uh, we finally ended up uh, executing 4,000. And many of those failed. For instance, 500 failed simply because they had duplicate cell numbers, like cell number seven was there twice, um, and things like that. And so we had to exclude them because that's not easily reproducible. And in the end, we had 396 that ran through uh, without any exception. And of these, the majority actually had <laughs> identical results, but uh, a, a good number didn't have the identical results to the original Notebook. So that's, in essence, if you don't take anything further, just uh, run with this slide and, and you're, you're fine uh, with the essence of our talk. Um, but we want to uh, discuss this. So we haven't fully published this, and also we, we can't easily because we're just scraping things from the web, essentially. We don't have the copyright to, so we're not allowed to actually share it in an aggregated fashion easily. Um, but we want to optimize the way that this data set is useful to the community. And um, because we expect that even those that are interested in this don't want to necessarily wait for an, uh, like two months to get the, uh, the data and uh, then have a, a terabyte floating around somewhere. Um, so um, we give you some basic statistics about this. And I would like to emphasize we have data, we have the full text of the articles. So we could essentially do anything you could do with full text, um, including figures, metadata, and anything. Then we have the full content of the repo, uh, including metadata like first commit, last commit, number of committers, number of forks, number of stars, all these kind of things. We have uh, the full data about the notebook, including all this metadata, like uh, how long did it take from um, the execution of cell number two to cell number three, or whatever, these kind of things. We ha have all of that. And uh, we also have uh, uh, the data, we, or we, we could, could, could parse it in terms of the languages. So that is actually shown here in the, this graph. Most of the notebooks were actually in Python. Some of them were in unknown, where, uh, like especially the early ones, where it wasn't easy to declare which kernel you were using. Uh, and then we have a good number of notebooks that are in R, Groovy, Julia, Scala, and so on. Um, and um, yeah, so we could analyze this by, by language. Just to give you a taste, here is uh, uh, a number of 
data points by journal. So here we have the number of articles in our corpus by journal. We have the number of repositories by journal. And in uh, differentiating in blue those repositories that have notebooks relevant for us, and red, uh, no, red are the ones that have it, and blue that don't have it. And here it's repositories with notebooks by journal, right? So um, then we can do all sorts of other statistics. So here's uh, the number of code cells across uh, notebooks, number of code cells with output, the uh, distribution mar number of markdown cells, or maximum execution count. So we had one with 2,076. Someone was really deeply into that one. Um, and we can do analysis on the notebook names. So uh, Untitled seems to be a very popular name. We had it uh, in this session, right? Um, and we can also look at changes over time, so trends. So we, uh, the year of creation of the repo, for instance, we can look at, um, or we can use as a variable, and then we can plot uh, the languages here. We can do this also for major and minor versions of uh, uh, of Python, for instance, and we can also uh, order this by last commit or first commit, whatever, right? I'm, I'm showing you this to give you a taste of the diversity of things and also to justify why we haven't explored it all. Like the reviewer said, well, you're sitting on this heap of data and you should basically visualize it all, essentially. And we said, first, we're not sitting on it. We want to share it early on so that the community can um, make use of it. And uh, second, well, uh, if we were to really plot every possible correlation between these things, that would be a lot of additional work, and it's not entirely useful, or at least not at least uh, at least not uh, beforehand. Okay, and we also have information about all the dependencies, so um, modules that are um, internal to the repo or external to the repo. Um, then uh, cases where the repo had a setup by a requirements text or pip file. And uh, yeah, so basically we can plot this by repository or by notebooks and, and so on. Um, then if we look at those dependencies a bit uh, more closely, then uh, we see NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib are very popular. And this is nice because the uh, pipeline that we used used Anaconda, and Anaconda has certain default libraries installed, scikit-learn, NumPy, and uh, Matplotlib, so there's good overlap. Um, so at least for the most common libraries in the corpus, we uh, made sure that they are always there. But there were some others as well. Uh, common issues actually is module not found, right? Uh, so um, if it wasn't in the Anaconda default, and it wasn't in the requirements text, it wasn't declared, well, then our stupidly automated pipeline just said, well, sorry, module not found. Um, and then uh, similar things, import error, file not found error, um, if you assume that somebody has a terabyte of gene data right next to your notebook, maybe not everybody has that, and uh, that makes it difficult to reproduce. So here we have some more statistics about just these three, the, the three more important. You can look at them by uh, year. For instance, initially, import error was the most popular one, and now it's, uh, it's kind of more even. And these three together make up roughly one third of all the errors uh, that we get in execution. And the point here is uh, this kind of data can actually help us prioritize uh, addressing reproducibility. So here we have data, what is the most common kind of error? Then we can think about, OK, is that something that we would worry about? Like module not found is probably something we should worry about. And then we can think about, OK, how can we improve that? Uh, shall we tell Anaconda to improve? Uh, or to, to in, enlarge the coverage of the modules that they put into their default or things like that? Or should we make some special um, arrangements for just biomedical um, publications? These are the kind of things we can discuss and for which we don't have solutions. We want to get community input into these kind of things. And we also want to get our pipeline or versions of it into community workflows in order to raise flags if certain aspects of reproducibility are in danger. Uh, then we can also analyze uh, or correlate, for instance, those few notebooks that actually ran through. We have looked at them, okay. Um, the, uh, some of them gave identical results and some of them gave different results from the original run, right? And so we've compared them. And it turns out those that gave identical results tended to have newer versions of Python, um, which uh, makes sense, kind of, yeah, but here now we have data for it. And uh, those uh, that had different results, they tended to have older versions of Python, right? Uh, some of those are just uh, simple uh, things. It's more or less common sense, but we have data. Um, next one um, for which we have data, the, and I've highlighted here two aspects of it. Um, all of the notebooks that finished and had identical results, all of them had either setup pi or requirement uh, text or both. 
none of those that finished with different results had either of those, right? So that is a very clear signal. Huh? So if you want uh, your notebook to run through, well, we don't know. It doesn't guarantee that, uh, that uh, like, if you have this uh, set apply or requirements text that it, uh, it will actually run through. But once it runs through, it has a decent chance to actually yield the original results. There are some other differences. So for instance, the, the ones that uh, gave different results tended to have more code cells. It tended to have lo uh, less markdown cells. And so the ratio of markdown to code cell, which is already used in some other papers as some sort of an indicator of quality or so, this uh, is different. And the execution time is also different, which you could uh, attributes to the code just being um, like more code cells or the code being more uh, more complex, which uh, fits with the execution time per cell, right? Um, yeah, and yeah, so that's the kind of statistics we can do. Um, now, um, apart from errors, we also looked at stylistic things. So um, there, um, here you get uh, like a flavor of it. E errors are for styling, F is definitions and W deprecations. And you see them all floating around here uh, at the order of like hundreds of thousands. Um, some of them is just white space. Um, who cares about white space? But yeah, Python is actually language that cares about white space, right? Um, and then, um, well, as I mentioned, we sent this to, to uh, the journal. And uh, in doing so, we had to think about self-replication, so replicating our own thing, even though we had done it internally already. Um, but the, um, the way we uh, replicated it uh, wasn't easily transferable to the journal, not easily shareable. And also, there are some considerations to take into account. So should we try to replicate the run that we made in February 2021? Uh, that would be fiddling with the way we queried the database back then. Um, or, um, and we have to keep in mind that the data that we're querying in this uh, literature repo is growing exponentially. So as I mentioned, originally 100 uh, such papers and now 5,000 uh, within a short period of time. And also, uh, an issue here is how much storage or memory should we allocate for this? So um, initially, we actually went with the default uh, settings of our cluster. Now, for the, the current run that is ongoing, um, we actually had, have set it to 128 gigabytes. So if any of you have published a notebook that requires 512 or so, it might well break our workflow. Thank you very much. Um, and yeah, as I mentioned, we are running one rerun uh, right now. Uh, we thought it would have been finished here for JupyterCon, but no, um, it's already going for six weeks and it's still ha happily going on. Um, we didn't do any parallelization. We also uh, ran everything on CPU. We didn't do any customization for GPUs or TPUs. Um, yeah, and of course, the first comment that we got from the reviewers, sorry, can't reproduce it, right? Um, and so, yeah, we... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, um, but we, we try to be transparent about it. And given the results that we had, he actually kind of confirmed our results, right? Um, so, um, but we try to be transparent about it. And so uh, we have made a set of 15 additional commits to our code that are uh, all documented. And we point to the reason why we made that particular commit. I don't have time to go into all the details. They are linked from, from the slides here. Um, and most of them actually have to do with the same problems that our notebooks suffer, like it's uh, dependency decay. Basically, some of the uh, code that we used used libraries, and those libraries were using some function that is now deprecated, right? And so we have to update the code in order to make the pipeline still run. And uh, yeah, we also had, since we have a, a, to deal with a larger number of notebooks now, um, we uh, had a larger variety of errors that popped up. So for instance, at some point we had a repo that was just empty. It was a GitHub repo, it was a valid GitHub repo, but it was empty. We hadn't foreseen that, and so that caused an error, so we had to change the code. Another thing was that our URL normalization uh, initially assumed that everything that uh, kind of fits a certain pattern is a GitHub repo, but no, there are also GitHub collections and topics, and of course you can't clone them. And yeah, so that's the kind of changes we had to make. And we also had to introduce support for new Python versions that have come around since we did the original run. And all of that is our own way of replicating our own study. Um, yeah, implications for all, all of this. So still, why do we, are we doing this? Um, scientific reproducibility uh, rests on a number of things. And, and this, if, it's induced, uh, if a study involves computation, then computational reproducibility is a key element of it. And uh, the automatically assessed computational reproducibility in this uh, corpus of biomedical literature that we looked at is low. 
uh, which means that there are opportunities for improvement, um, which uh, would affect scientific reproducibility, that would also affect learning and teaching opportunities. Like, why do we always teach uh, like, well, from scratch? Why don't we go into the live data? Why don't we start a tutorial or um, a carpentry session with, by just analyzing those notebooks that are already there, that have trouble reproducing? And then, um, by getting people to fix those errors, they would be exposed to more life, like, like real life uh, experience. And we c now can provide you data. Like we can tell you, if, if you uh, like this kind of E512 or so kind of error, then uh, I can give you a list of all those notebooks that meet these criteria, right? Um, and then we can also think uh, of about standardization. We can, uh, for instance, there is already uh, the practice of listing your imported modules at the top. What about external things? Some people, for instance, assume that you have large data sets or um, let's say Java or Cytoscape installed on your system. If we um, like make this clear in an automated and standardized fashion, either in a requirements text or at the top of the notebook, then the, the failures would occur earlier and our pipeline would run shorter. We've had some that actually had a notebook like run for hours and then it noticed, oh, I also, now I want to put this into Cytoscape, but yeah, we didn't install Cytoscape, sorry, right? Um, and in the start of standardization, we can also look at uh, Tools, integrating tools, for instance, people who run Jupyter Hubs could integrate some tools that uh, flag certain reproducibility issues. One of the tools is Reproduce Me Git, which my colleague um, is actually developing and maintaining, which uh, can take in a notebook and then gives you certain representations of uh, reproducibility. And here we can go for some low-hanging fruits. Um, many notebooks had no declared dependencies, but they did use code that wasn't entirely in the notebook, right? And so if a notebook does not have any requirements text or set up pi or anything like that, we could raise a flag. Uh, another one uh, with those 500 notebooks that had duplicate cell numbers, that is another one easy to detect and easy to solve in most cases, right? And uh, another thing that's a bit more let's say involved, but still relatively simple compared to the rest of the, this discussion is identify points in the publication process where someone should check the code. Because right now it's not entirely clear and whether it's the authors, the editors, the reviewers, or uh, some third party or so. And then also the tooling that we would need for this, uh, there's Binder, yeah, but Binder doesn't scale. We couldn't package our study for Binder. It would just say no, sorry, and it would quickly say no, and for good reason, because it's uh, the, the way it's built right now, it uh, just um, is not built for these kind of things. But we have to help it scale, and also there is actually a post of, uh, uh, about this later on. Um, now, back, my original motivation for going into this was when I knew very little about uh, Jupyter. I just wanted to reference Jupyter Notebooks in Wikipedia articles, right? Um, and by now I've learned a bit more, <laughs> but still the main question still resides. Should I dare and uh, go into these ice uh, glacier model, um, modelization that we've seen earlier in the session and now uh, put the notebooks there into the Wikipedia articles about all the glaciers? And I still hesitate with the experience that we've had. And the question is, can the community give me some assurance that uh, this would be a worthwhile thing to do? Things like that. Um, in the process of dealing with all of that, um, some uh, of our data has also um, been moved to Wikidata, uh, which is a sister project to Wikipedia. And so there we could tag, for instance, the entries about the papers as uh, such that uh, it is clear that that paper has used uh, Jupyter, for instance. And then from that, and by doing the, uh, this uh, with other things that have been used by the research, we get the code usage graph. Uh, you can do this by analyzing dependencies if you're just staying within the Jupyter ecosystem, but uh, things like Cytoscape or uh, ImageJ, they are external things. You wouldn't uh, capture that from requirements text. And so here you get that you can basically browse the literature by method this way. Um, and also you can get, uh, I've linked this here, um, you could get a map of um, institutions that have authors who have published papers that were using Jupyter. So that's a few steps remote from what you can easily get. Uh, from other places, but Wikidata allows this kind of thing. And um, then Wikimedia also runs a Jupyter Hub instance uh, that is used to edit Wikimedia wik uh, um, projects like Wikipedia, Wikidata, and so on. And uh, so there is opportunity, and Wikipedia has certain visibility, so there are opportunities to, uh, to standardize. 
we tried to capture the environmental footprint, and so we used one website that gave us a number uh, which says that the, own, the run that is documented in the preprint, which took 117 hours and 52 minutes, uh, that had a carbon footprint of a 90 kilometer uh, run in a passenger car, basically, or one third of a flight from here to London. Um, but the problem is we didn't account for test runs, failed runs. Most of the test runs actually failed. Uh, we c didn't account for our own code development. We didn't account for any of the hardware we used. We didn't account for the external code de development. We were using lots of libraries and so on. And we didn't account for the trips to JupyterCon, right? And um, so the calculation is an underestimate, but we would encourage everyone to keep that in, in mind and include it in the way you report about Jupyter. So rep recommendations, we actually had submitted a separate talk about just recommendations that came out of our study. This was rejected, so here you have one slide. <laughs> um, and uh, so the essence of this is we have existing recommendations about how to uh, achieve re uh, reproducibility in scientific context, computational rep uh, reproducibility in particular, and how to deal with Jupiter. But the problem is they are high level. They don't sit at the point where you're making the decisions. They are not near your keyboard when you're uh, coding or uh, when you're doing your research. And so we need closer integration between those recommendations and the actual workflows. There are some attempts at this. So for instance, there's Drew Linter. Um, and uh, we should support uh, experimentation in this range. Also, uh, those recommendations so far, they don't really specify the different types of stakeholders. Uh, they don't take into account. So for instance, the author of the notebook Notebook, uh, uh, like a, a researcher, uh, is assumed to take care of all of that. But for instance, if someone is running a Jupyter Hub, maybe the hub operators also have certain responsibilities and opportunities to help improve uh, the system systemically, or even funders if they require more or support certain kinds of things more, and so on. Um, and then also there are uh, different types of dependencies, especially that uh, you just assume that Java is installed on the system where you run your notebook, right? Uh, the, these kind of things, there should be cross-language communication should be facilitated. Also, uh, our recommendation is to make notebooks citable, but before you cite them, please run them and check whether they still give the result for which you would like to cite them. Um, and also, we uh, recommend that you routinely rerun notebooks, including your own, but also others. You, you learn both ways. If uh, your own notebooks don't rerun and don't give the same results, that teaches you something. It helps understand your workflows better. And if you rerun someone else's notebooks, you learn about new things, uh, the tools that they've used. And uh, we would recommend that you monitor the environmental footprint to the extent that you can. OK, now, how can you get involved? We have a number of questions here. How ca uh, can, shall we share the data set in a way that's maximum use to the community? How would you use it? Like, which variables of the many variables that we have about the corpus um, would you like to look at? And which research questions would you like to bring to the corpus? How would you use it in teaching or learning? Um, what would be used for follow-ups? So we could, for instance, think about turning this into a service where you submit a notebook or a repo, and then it spits out certain measures of reproducibility. Would NumFocus be someone who would like to take this on, who, or somebody else here? Uh, who wants to do this for other languages? So far, we've focused on Python, but there are other languages that are using Jupyter. And also, um, if you have analyzes, uh, have analyzed an individual rep uh, notebook or um, several of them, um, you could write reports about this, and those reports could even be standardized. Would you like to write those reports? Would you like to read those reports? And, and so on. I run a journal. I could uh, set up such a pu publishing pipeline. Yeah, and now uh, we would like to thank you and also the summary, the, there's a pictorial summary. Even though we start with some com computation that we've encapsulated in the Jupyter Notebook, there's no guarantee that we always get the same output. Um, and also there's no guarantee that we get some useful output at all. But yeah, we would like to thank you. Most of this is spare time work. I'm here as a volunteer. Um, uh, but we did get some uh, support, most notably from the cluster at the University of Vienna, where we are still performing the calculations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniel, for this uh, great talk. And uh, so we'll say that in spite of all that, uh, Notebook is, is actually a good way to publish scientific computation because you can't try this instead of like scripts where you can't. Yeah, well, it, it makes it easier to, to assess the reproducibility. In some other cases, it's just more enigmatic, yes. Uh, hi. Uh, thanks uh, for the talk. Uh, do you include in your pipeline, like, uh, for example, you had a lot of uh, found not found or import errors. Uh, in the papers, like, theoretically, they should be 
uh, run or uh, I know like most of a lot of papers have uh, data uh, available under you know uh, requests or up the short, short answer is no. We had a co completely automated pipeline, and so we didn't look into any anything individual. So if they had written in the readme file or in the acknowledgement or in the data availability statement, yeah, you can find the data there, that would be ignored by us. But we could add this. If you say there is a certain pattern we should search for in the data availability statement or, or so, we could add this. We have the full text, right? Hey, how's it going? Thanks for the talk. I would just really like to have a conversation with you when you get a chance. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really interesting talk. I like the level of detail as well. One thing I was thinking about in terms of identical results, though, in a notebook, is that what the goal should be, what about floating point error or Sometimes in, in my notebooks that I teach with, I leave exceptions in there because the students need to see those sorts of failures as well. Yeah, I think for, uh, that's again something we could drill into. I would assume uh, if you are working with dynamic data that the results would be different. Uh, if you're working with some random functions that the results would be different and also there are floating point errors, yeah, those kind of things. Um, we haven't drilled it much further into that. Uh, but we could, and that's, again, something that we would like the community uh, to, to tell us, basically. If you're interested in that, it, the data is there. And also we could do this in other disciplines. This was just biomedicine. I know that other disciplines are using this as well, and we, our code is open. We're there to collaborate. Okay, thank you very much. I think it's, uh, if there is no more question, we can uh, go to the next Speaker. Thank you very much, Daniel.